Tonight we have miter. What? Do you have something, Burn? Thanks, Burn. Tonight we have mitochondrial health. We have Burn Prelander, Phil Miller, Douglas Husbands. Burn Freelander, Dr. Chiropractic, has a bachelor's degree in physical education, emphasis in applied kinesiology from San Francisco State University, and a doctorate of chiropractic degree from Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. He has been involved in developing nutritional therapies since 1982. As a result of his therapeutic formulas, he's pioneered the research and use of nutrition and free form amino acids for improving athletic performance as a safe alternative to steroids. During his career, Dr. Freelander has served as a nutritional and a sports injury consultant for athletic members of track teams at UCLA, USC, Berkeley, Stanford, and many professional track and field athletes from all over the U.S. He's also worked with professional players from Los Angeles Rams, Los Angeles Raiders, Clippers, Lakers, Chargers. In 1984, as a chiropractor and nutritional Patricia consultant to numerous members of the U.S. Olympic track and field teams, the U.S. Olympic crew teams. In the ensuing years, Dr. Freelander has developed a number of proprietary nutritional formulas. These products are designed to maintain and promote health and longevity. He's an experienced speaker, has lectured across the country for over 30 years on nutrition and anti-aging, and has made numerous TV and radio appearances, and he has written sports and nutritional articles and has given interviews for numerous magazines. Dr. Philip Lee Miller, medical doctor, founder and medical director of the Los Gatos Longevity Institute, has been in the medical practice for over 36 years. The institute enjoys a worldwide reputation. He's a pioneer of, of longevity and anti-aging medicine. He graduated from UC Berkeley in 1968, centennial class with a degree in biochemistry, later graduated from the School of Medicine at UC San Diego in 1972 with an MD degree in the school's first charter graduating class and went on to pursue further training in neurology at UC Davis. He has been an ABM board certified emergency medicine and is now a dip diplomat of the ABAAM board. Dr. Neil Miller has become a leader in non-traditional medicine with a close one-year association with Dr. Julian Whitaker of the Whitaker Wellness Institute in Newport Beach, California. He is currently a charter member of the American Academy for Anti-Aging Medicine and has passed the first ever board exams in anti-aging medicine in December of 1997 and December of 1998 becoming board qualified by the ABAAM Board of American Board on Anti-Aging Medicine. He holds a distinctive membership in the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, European Academy for Quality of Life, Longevity, the American College for Advancement in Medicine, uh, American Academy of Neurology, as well as Santa Clara Medical. Dr. Miller co-authored a seminal book on anti-aging medicine, The LEF Revolution, The New Science of Growing Older Without Aging, released in 2005. Dr. Miller has written cogent and provocative blogs for Huffington Post, submits similar blogs on the health medicine update. Dr. Douglas Husband, Dr. Chiropractic, certified clinical nutritionist, has been helping people resolve chronic illnesses and improve their health in California for over 20 years. He has worked in health care for over 25 years. Dr. Husband is one of the best trained holistic doctors in the U.S. He graduated from San Francisco State University with a B.S. degree in biology and human physiology in 1983. In 1991, he graduated from Cleveland Chiropractic College of Los Angeles and became a doctor of chiropractic. In 1996, he earned his nutritional with International and American Association of Clinical Nutritionists, and in 2000 became a certified anti-aging health care practitioner with the American Board of Anti-Aging Health Practitioners. In 2003, he maintained a functional medicine phys physician after completing training with the Institute for Functional Medicine. He is currently working towards his board certification in functional medicine. Prior to becoming a chiropractor in 1991, he worked in sports medicine as a physical therapist aide and personal exercise training business in, in the 80s. Dr. Husband has been sought for expert opinions by nutritional, national health magazines and been published in peer-reviewed journals. He has taught many classes and lectured extensively to a wide variety of audiences on natural, natural health topics and functional medicine. You have two minutes. <laughs> All right. Now, so we're, and I'm going to keep this very short, if two minutes, if that. 
Who here, who here saw the movie The Right Stuff? Okay. All right. Who remembers in the movie? I always like to start with a story because it wakes people up and gets people involved. Um, uh, who remembers the part where right after the explosion in the Apollo uh, uh, service module when they were out in space and the, the engineers find out this and they're like, <gasps> and, and then they start running around talking and discussing each, what's, what's going on, and, you know, what we should do. And then there's a guy in the background, he comes, guys, guys, wait, wait a minute, wait, hold, hold on, wait a minute. It's all power. That, everything else is, is extra. If we don't have power, it doesn't matter what, what we do. We need power. We're talking about mitochondria today. That's the whole point. Our, our body, we need energy. If, if you don't have my, good mitochondrial function, you, you ain't going to have power. You're not going to have energy. So with that, I want to start this discussion. We need mito good mitochondrial function for power, for energy. Thanks. Um, I think what you're going to hear from all of us is there's going to be an overlap, which is good because what will happen is we'll reinforce each other in terms of what what is the mitochondrium, what is this all about, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of the physiology and the biochemistry and and something more higher order. Why is this important to us as, as a matter of an aging issue and uh, a health issue? So I actually, I wasn't sure whether we were supposed to do this. So at the last minute I wrote Bert, I said, are we supposed to talk? So I thought we were just gonna sit down and kind of just feel questions. So this is probably the shortest talk I ever put together. I put it together in one night. I was pretty happy I did that because it's actually pretty good and I think you'll enjoy this. It's really concise. So we start with the concept of age and power and I'm going to kind of expand upon that. This is a, a, a diagram of the mammalian cell and what's important here is if you, if you look at this right here, here's the mitochondria. And you can see all these other structures here. And all these, here's the mitochondria, here's the mitochondria. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the lysosomes are all about as well. The mitochondria, this is what it looks like in a photomicrograph. And this is a structural diagram of what the mitochondria does. And it has these different compartments, has its own DNA, so it has its own mitochondrial DNA. Um, there's an inner membrane, an outer membrane, and then I'm going to show you within the structure, what's going on. This is, I have a degree in biochemistry. And so when I went through this, I looked at this, and you, know, you get these aha moments like, you know, you've sort of known, you've sort of known it. And you get these moments where, oh, that's really interesting how this all fits together. Because you've studied this, but then you see the overall picture. And what this shows really is, the interesting thing is, is it's showing you the power output the power input of the mitochondria is either glucose or free fatty acids. The power output is ATP. And it's really interesting how nature is designed. You can go through glycolysis where you break down glucose and you get two ATP. And you go through another pathway, you go through the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle that you've heard over and over again, Nobel Prize winners, and you get two ATP. But you go through this thing called the electron transport chain, which is this multiplier effect, and you get 34 ATP. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about if any engineer here was given an assignment to, to actually construct the elegance of this machine here, I'm not sure you could come up with this. It's an amazing thing that nature has developed. The other thing is that I didn't know this until about five or 10 years ago is that the DNA has its own, uh, the, the mitochondria has its own DNA. So there's a cellular DNA, which is the nuclear DNA, but the mitochondria has its own DNA. And that DNA is maternal. You get that from your mother. Father, somehow they kind of chew up that chromosome, discard it, and you get nothing from your father. So your mitochondria, your energy factor, is all maternal. And 
it's really interesting how this thing works, and I'm not going to go into that in great depth. So the concept of energy, and I've been thinking about this for the last few years, is, and I just read this today, that actually, as usual, the first notion of energy was promulgated by Aristotle, who was probably the smartest human being in world history. But the real concept of energy as a concept really didn't come into play until about the 19th century. Because it's a weird concept to try to get your head around. We all talk about energy, but to actually define what is energy is actually very abstract and it's a very complex subject that I went through thermodynamics, I went through physical chemistry, and I barely understood what I was really understanding. So I found out in the last few years it's probably better not to talk about uh, this 19th century concept of there's Gibbs free energy, there's Helmholtz free energy, there's potential energy, there's kinetic energy, there's stored up energy, like a battery, there's motion energy, we're running. I think it's more important to talk about power. So we talk about I'm running out of energy, I'm running out of energy. What's more important is you're running out of power. Power is the ability to move, move thought, sex, physical, spiritual. It's the power is what we're losing, not energy. So we use energy as a concept, but I think it's power which is an easier concept to define because power really is just a rate of work. How much work can an organism produce in a certain amount of time? So with that, again, the primary output of the mitochondria is ATP. That's what's being produced. That is the energy and the power source that we're looking for is how do we produce ATP. And this is actually my theory that I've developed, which is that as we get older, and older, you know, older is anything that's 20 years older than you. <laughs> so when you're 10, 30s old, when you're 30, 50s old, when you're 50, 70 years old, and when you're 70, well, 90 is old, okay? When you get to be 90, I'm not sure what you think of when you're 90. And my mother will be 90 in about a month or two. So I think it's more important to think about um, these levels of losing power, it roughly after the age, I mean, it could be any age, but I think it's really progressive after the age of 75. So after 60, we begin to lose a lot of power, 65, but it becomes really progressive in patients that I see after 75. And I see it at all levels. It could be physical, it could be locomotive, you're walking slower, it could be sexual, it could be cognitive, it could be spiritual, and eventually, at the end, it's just willpower, is what I think you're losing. So again, what you see is, you've got these three areas here. You've got glycolysis, that's the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate, produces ATP, but it's spinning off a bunch of molecules that feeds into the citric acid cycle, spins off ATP, but when it goes into this area here, knew this would happen. When it goes into this area here, this is where all the energy is coming from. So again, there's three phases of respiration. This is mitochondrial respiration. So there's lung respiration and there's biochemical metabolic respiration. And again, glycolysis, free fatty acids, oxidative. Now, when I looked at this, this is what I think is really important. I think when we're younger, and we can measure this. When you're younger, when you're 15 or 20, 25 or 30, we are burning fat as our main source. Because fat is two and a half times as strong in terms of per kilogram as carbohydrate. As we get older, whether because we're slowing down, because we're eating crummier food, because of metabolism, for one reason or another, we shift to carbohydrate metabolism, which is less efficient, and that's what's leading to diabetes. So you can go through glycolysis, which is using glucose and produce ATP. You can go through fatty acid metabolism, which requires carnitine, which is a critical element that can't get people to take enough of. And it eventually goes into this fox escalated phosphorylation pathway. So you have this pathway of glycolysis, this pathway of fatty acid. And that's what we'd really like to be doing as we get older, is to burn up fat and convert that into fuel. <coughs> And there's now the day of phosphorylation. So here's the citric acid cycle. Everybody's trying to sell vitamins or trying to sell a new thing. You say, 
Well, you know, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, um, processes were used to develop this process, and they all refer to the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is this thing that starts again. Here's pyruvate that comes from glucose, and it goes through this thing here, and what it's doing is it's spinning off these NADs. And these NADs are the first source of fuel that gets thrown into the next phase. So it's throwing out these NADs here. And probably at one time, you probably heard of Inada NAD. So NAD is another energy source. But it has to be in the reduced form, which is more expensive. What I've been concentrating on is this thing right here. This is a thing that I've been using lately with amazing success to lose weight. And nobody knows exactly, but I think this, this compound here primes the whole pump. What is it? It's called Benagene. Yeah. Benagene is oxaloacetate. And it's so simple, it's like, what does that do? Well, all I can tell you is, I think it induces weight loss. It goes in the electron transport system. Now this is where you get this multiplier effect. All these NADs are now shooting into here. That's coming from the Krebs cycle. And it's coming down here, this multiplier effect. And the really important thing is, see this thing right here? That's CoQ10. That's CoQ10. So now we have Inada and we have CoQ10. CoQ10, for some reason, and this is what I'm trying to figure out, is one of the critical rate limiting steps. Because CoQ10, we know, is critical for heart function, critical for brain function, energy. Anybody who's taking a statin must be taking CoQ10 because it's being destroyed by the statins. But you can see this is where CoQ10 is working. It's in this electron transport system. But there are other complexes here, cytochrome oxidase A, cytochrome oxidase C. Each one of these is, pro see here's the C. So each one of these has an important role to play. This is the one we focus on, and we focus on this one here. And what comes spinning out of here? 34 ATPs. So here's the glycolysis, here's the Krebs cycle, and it's spinning into the mitochondria. Now, I borrowed some of this from John Ferber, um, and this is really an important concept of what's happened to our mitochondria. I told you, as we get older, I think that our mitochondria are decaying, it's the source of our energy, and the reason why we're losing energy as we get older is that either the mitochondria are not replicating, they're getting junked up, or we're just losing them one way or another. So John's come up with this notion that here's these lysosomes. Here's the DNA. The lysosome in each cell, its purpose is to clear out debris. So if everybody puts out their hand, they look at all the age spots, that age spot is lipofuscin which I call, technically called schmutz. That lipofuscin says that you are not clearing out this debris. So there's that cellular debris. That lipofuscin is a good way of telling whether or not you've got it probably depositing behind your eyes, which can lead to macular edema. And it may be depositing your head, which is probably a precursor for Alzheimer's disease. So intracellularly, all this stuff here, there's a breakdown of the mitochondria and the lysosome is supposed to take care of that. If the lysosome gets junked up with lipofuscin, then the lipofuscin, then the lysosome can't do their normal duty of cleaning up old mitochondria. The mitochondria wear out. When the lysosomes get clogged up with lipofuscin, then their ability to digest mitochondria rapidly slows and mitochondrial density declines. So there's a so there's this process of that whole debris and that replication slows down, gets junked up, lose mitochondria, lose power. Lose power, we're aging. Bruce Ames, who was actually my uh, advisor when I was uh, in biochemistry at Berkeley, um, when he first started, he was just a young guy. Did I? I copied that. I think I. Co I don't think I spelled it. Okay, but you're right. I think there's no am in there, i in there. Anyway, Bruce wrote this article that brain mitochondria decay with age is associated with increase in oxidative damage to mitochondria, a decrease in activity, substrate binding, affinity of all these parts here, leading to a level. And he showed this in the young rat. These results show 
mitochondrial decay is a key contributor to aging and that feeding lipoic acid and acetyl carnitine or carnitine in sufficient doses and the right dose is six grams a day not one not two six grams a day can ameliorate the mitochondrial decay and oxidative damage by improving the mitochondrial redox homeostasis these results also suggest that the amelioration of mitochondrial decay with dietary supplementation with antioxidants and nutrients target to mitochondria may be an effective strategy for delaying brain aging as I said, I keep that short and pithy. Protect your mitochondria. Thank you. I'm going to make this, I'm just going to do this like a discussion. And um, so, by the way, the movie was Apollo 13. I think I said the right stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. The movie, it was Apollo 13. Remember that one where the guy came in and he said, wait a minute, power. Is, everything else is secondary. So if you don't have power, nothing's going to run. So that's basically what the mitochondria are. And um, piggybacking on what Bill said, um, I want to say a little bit more that there are between about 200 and 3,000 uh, mitochondria in each and every cell. Now, and we're going to kind of more do this like a discussion. So, which cells do you think? Not, don't answer because you know. Okay, all right. <laughs> which which cells which cells do you think have the most mitochondria? In other words, the most energy. Um, requiring ones, and not, don't you answer either. Okay, so which, which cells have the most energy requiring um, uh, functioning? Brain, heart, brain, heart, and lungs. There you go, yeah. Brain, heart, and muscles. Okay, let's think about that. Okay, now obviously those are always requiring energy production. In fact, um, what, uh, from some research studies I just looked at before I came here, um, what the research says is that 75% of the cell, cells of heart are packed with mitochondria. 75%. Now I just uh, was at the, last year at the uh, Institute for Functional Medicine Cardio uh, Metabolic <coughs> Module with Dr. Mark Houston, and he, he quote, in that, he quoted 50%. Um, so that's something that, from uh, looking back at the studies, um, um, it's, it seems to be more like 75%. In other words, they're, they're just packed with mitochondria, the heart cells. The brain cells are also just packed with mitochondria, and the muscles also. And also, as far as mitochondrial Plasticity. In other words, you can change the number, yes, you can change the number of mitochondria in the cells. What things change the number of mitochondria? Well, um, obviously exercise. That's going to change the uh, number of mitochondria in each and every cell. Um, antioxidants to provide the uh, protection of the very, very sensitive mitochondrial uh, membrane and the mitochondrial DNA. And Phil is absolutely right regarding it's all maternal. What happens is on, at, at uh, the point of uh, conception where the sperm comes in and implants into the ovary, um, the, there's, uh, there's the, the head of the sperm and then there's, the, um, there's uh, basically a little uh, motor uh, that um, twirls the tail of the sperm. In that motor, there's a whole bunch of mitochondria. Well, when the, that 
that sperm implants into the, the uh, egg, that um, little motor and the tail break off and, that, and the sperm puts their, its uh, uh, contribution to the DNA in there. But the um, paternal mitochondria break off. So what does, that, what does that mean for as far as women taking care of themselves? This is a uh, theoretical question. Just not, you, you can understand where I'm getting at here. You, you need to, women especially, especially women of childbearing age, really need to make sure that they're doing things that are taking care of their mitochondria. And there are, um, there's a concept called mitochondrial resuscitation. Uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that lifestyle, dietary factors, and nutritional supplementation, you're making sure that you're uh, helping your mitochondria to produce the optimum amount of energy possible. There's a very good book, just practically uh, speaking, that is an easy read, brainrecovery.com. Dr. David Perlmutter, who is also um, and a colleague with the Institute for Functional Medicine, in fact, he's teaching, he's one of the teachers um, at this coming module this summer. Uh, it's on energy, by the way. Um, and we're going to be really talking about mitochondria. This book came out, brainrecovery.com. This book came out, um, it was, I think it was self-published, uh, but it came out in 2000. You can go on his website, uh, just brainrecovery.com, and he, if you just Google Dr. David Perlmutter, you'll eventually get to it. This is a very easy read, and it really is, for the average person, a really good book, because what he goes through in here is he goes through many, all the common neurodegenerative diseases. And what he does is he says, okay, why are we using these uh, mitochondrial resuscitating nutrients? NAC, um, niacin, the antioxidants, lipoic acid. Why are we using that? Be again, because it influences mitochondria. And that, in essence, is what the problem is with neurodegenerative diseases. It's not the absence of um, some of these drugs you have. It is the absence or insufficiency of and damage to the mitochondria and insufficiency of the nutrients uh, providing um, power for the mitochondria. Something also about uh, carnitine. Um, there are two types if you want, just very practical. If you want to increase brain function, uh, the mitochondrial brain function, you'll more want to use acetyl L-carnitine. If you want to hit, hit, so to speak, the mitochondria of the heart and skeletal muscles, L-carnitine. Now, a caveat that Phil didn't mention that I've run into, and, and there's research that stays on this, and I pulled them up uh, to make sure I was certain on this, um, but I've seen both as a clinician in practice, and Phil, maybe you've seen this too, but L-carnitine, if someone has hyperthyroidism, you, you given at about um, four or five grams per day, it actually it lowers um, thyroid hormone production. So, and this is in the literature, there's a, a bunch of research studies that, I didn't bring them with me, but um, it is in the literature. And I've practically seen that too. So that's a caveat if someone has hyper, too high thyroid production, then you want to um, not get the L-carnitine at, the L-carnitine, not the acetyl-L-carnitine, at uh, more than about more than about uh, two or three grams per day. Um, N-acetylcysteine, another extremely important mitochondrial um, re-energizer, is extremely important for um, utilization of the uh, fats and uh, providing um, energy and an antioxidant effect um, for the mitochondria. Um, the one thing about, uh, going back to carnitine, carnitine, um, the L-carnitine or the acetyl L-carnitine, more of the acetyl L-carnitine, what it also does is it kind of is a, acts like a shuttle. 
it um, carries the fats um, circulating in the blood, uh, free fatty acids um, circulating into the blood to be carried into the mitochondria, into the inner membrane so that it can be used for energy. That's also why um, it, it um, helps with energy production of the mitochondria. Um, coenzyme Q10, um, you, can, you can take um, all the statins you want and that is not at the core going to resolve dyslipidemia. Um, but what you better do if you are using coenzyme Q10, if you do choose to do, do things that way, I'm sorry, if you do use statins, um, then you'd better um, utilize coenzyme Q10. Because one of that, it very much influences, it actually shuts down your body's own um, ubiquinone or ubiquinol, i.e. Co CoQ10 production. And again, getting back to power, energy, the core, one of the core principles of cellular energy production. You've got to have coenzyme Q10 as the gas for the power plants of the cells, so to speak. When you, when you, if you shut that process down, as statins do, very well known, there's no debate on that anymore, they do. Um, then you better be taking CoQ10. And what I find, as far as dosage of CoQ10, that is individual, but generally what I find is that um, anyone taking statins should be using about 300 milligrams of CoQ10. If you're, even if you're not taking statins, if you want to help keep your mitochondria uh, healthy and good energy levels, then about 100 milligrams CoQ10 per day would be advisable. Um, um, L -car I've talked about L-carnitine. Um, the antioxidants, let me talk about that for a second. The mitochondrial membrane is a, um, a, bilayer, a bilipid layer membrane um, similar to the cellular membrane. The mitochondrial membrane, however, is more sensitive to uh, oxidative damage. Um, so, you want to number one, make sure that you have good essential fatty acid in, through dietary and through, through supplementation. Um, and you want to make sure that you also have plenty of antioxidants to protect against oxidative damage of that mitochondrial membrane. Since it is more sensitive to oxidative damage, um, then you want to make sure that you're, you're getting plenty of antioxidants. What antioxidants? Lipoic acid, the R-lipoic acid does seem to be, most of the preponderance of the research studies does seem to indicate that the R form of lipo lipoic acid um, does seem to be absorbed better. Um, the um, anti vitamin E is a very powerful antioxidant, vitamin C is also a very powerful antioxidant. Um, regarding, how many of you recall the, the studies back in, in fact, they just, they keep, re it's almost like they keep repeating these. Let's see, I see I've got uh, two minutes, 50 seconds. Oh, okay, all right, uh, okay. Anyway, so vitamin E, uh, very powerful antioxidant, very necessary antioxidant. You wanna get the, the mixed uh, tocopherols, okay? Now, just very practical. I said I'm gonna be real practical on this. If you see on your supplement, if it has DL alpha tocopherol, just remember the L stands for lousy, okay? So if you have D, if you go on your, if you get any uh, certain big drug stores, I'm not gonna say, we're on TV, I don't wanna get sued, uh, but uh, certain big drug stores, uh, CVS Pharma, um, anyway, um, um, if, you, if you have, if you have a DL alpha tocopherol, the L stands for lousy. Throw that away. Don't give it to your cat, your dog. Don't take it. Throw it away. Okay. If, if you have a okay supplement with D alpha tocopherol, well, that's okay. But m better is you want to make sure that you have the mixed tocopherols. The gamma tocopherols are very, very important. Uh, the gamma, the delta tocopherols are also extremely important. Um, Important, the mixed tocopherols are what you want to have. Um, 
there, regarding getting back to the study and the what I have one minute twenty five seconds left. I'm going to cut it short a little bit, but anyway, um, the studies that you you see again we're coming to where you people say, well, I saw this study on vitamin E, where it's dangerous. Well, there's a study back in the '90s called the Carrot Study, Carotenoid and Risk Intervention Trial, C A R E T study. Okay, that was back in the '90s. What they did is they, they took um, these smokers, heavy smokers, and they gave them vitamin E. And what they did, they used, hot, I'm sorry, no, that, the, the carotenoid, I'm sorry, that was the, the A. Um, anyway, the, the A can act as an antioxidant too. But anyway, the bottom line is what they did was they gave a whole bunch of synthetic vitamin A in the carrot study. Um, they've done this with the, uh, the other antioxidant studies. The bottom line is they, they do these synthetic nutrients at one nutrient with, at a real high dose that you're not going to find in nature. And then they come up with, oh, well, see, this person, they got, they got uh, increased cancer rate because of the uh, high dose of beta carotene. Well, duh, I could have told you that. You didn't even need to do the study. So again, the point here is synergistic effects. Nutrients work synergistically, and you need, yes, de by all means, you definitely want to get them primarily from foods, but I, maybe I will use my extra two minutes here. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you want to definitely get them from foods pri primarily, but utilizing um, nutritional supplementation is also very beneficial also, and very necessary according to proponents of research. Now there is a handout I've given you just regarding this, because in effect, as far as where things are, I gave you this handout. If you didn't get one, there's more up here. This is basically a little simple picture of what happens outside of the mitochondrial membrane and inside the mitochondrial membrane. As Phil said, you have, you have only two ATP produced by glycolysis out here, and then you have uh, two in the uh, uh, Krebs cycle and the, the electron transport cha chain, you have 34 ATP produced. This is just a quick little picture of what you want to do because you want to keep that, it, all, by all means, if anything, you forget everything we say, you need to keep your mitochondria functioning at optimum levels for anti-aging effects and for energy effects throughout your life. Thank you. The one and only, Kern Freelander. I'm going to make it quick, but uh, oh, we want to. We want to. I know. Um, you know how I got into the mitochondria. I guess in sports you have to. Uh, um, this is a presentation I did at the Academy of Anti-Aging Conference several years ago at uh, San Jose, and I spoke about cellular anti-aging in uh, in that area. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through there. Um, yeah, so, you know, being in sports and nutrition in the early 70s, in 1978 I was uh, given a position at UCLA to uh, develop a uh, clinic in the sports uh, uh, rehab center for athletic performance. And one of the things is you, um, you have athletes who are competing and there's so many good athletes and they all have the ability to perform. Some of them can perform better than others, and a lot of it was the mindset of the individual, the confidence, the ability to willing to win. Um, but I noticed also the overtraining of these athletes and seriously declining performance and injuries. And the worst diet I've ever seen was in 1970s with these athletes and some of the greatest athletes like Carl Lewis and Ron Brown and all that would eat Twinkies and Reese's peanut butter cups and they wonder why they break down so easily. And overtraining was another problem. Um, I had the fortunate uh, time to spend with the East Germans and the Russians at that period of time because in 78 we were training for the uh, Olympics for 1980 which was in Russia and I learned a lot from them in their way of testing athletes. They were measuring lactate, lactate and CO2 in their athletes. So if they were developing lactic acid, they backed them off. If they were uh, low in CO2, 
they, get, uh, they backed them off and they started doing all kinds of IVs and hyperbaric chambers and UV lights. They actually put their athletes in ultraviolet light and Bill Grant and I talked about that. And realizing they were measuring mitochondrial function. These were these Germans and Russians and the Canadians. Um, so it was very important how to monitor athletes at that period of time. So I started working with my athletes doing the same thing, looking at <coughs> blood tests and monitoring the CO2, lactic acids, C-reactive protein, uh, many other areas, you know, <coughs> looking at calcium, and et cetera. And there was a, a brilliant doctor at UCLA who pointed out to me, he was a thyroid expert, Dr. Schwartz. I remembered him. He was a patient. And uh, there was another fellow that I became very close friends who also became a pre uh, patient of mine was Roy Wolford, who did the caloric restriction diet, but he did it too extreme to the point that he gave up fat and protein. And then another patient at that period of time I had was uh, Pritikin, who also was the low fat, low protein fella who developed a lot of problems, heart, uh, and also developed leukemia, I think it was. So one thing I've learned was um, what Schwartz says, monitor your thyroid key to performance. And he was right. So he taught me the underarm measurement uh, of the athletes before they got out of bed. And if they maintained around 98, they were doing well. If they were low, then you knew they were uh, not functioning right, they weren't repairing, they weren't regenerating. And so I started looking at everything I can to help the mitochondria, the thyroid, and enhancing their performance. And we looked at, in the 1978, I got a hold of biotics research, soroyal uh, neutrodyne, et cetera, and they were able to provide me CoQ10, gamma risinol, ferulic acid, amino acid from Don Tyson, and we started using these nutritional applications to athletes. And by 1980, we qualified, all our athletes qualified for the Olympics. But it was boycotted because of the Russian situation. So we started over again and started another four-year training. And in 1984, we had Evelyn Ashford, Jackie Joyner, Florence Griffith Joyner, and uh, Carl Lewis, and Edwin Moses, and all these other. But they were all training with nutritional approaches, mental approaches, and uh, mechanics. and and not overtraining either. One of the problems I noticed, American athletes overtrain. You can see that all the time, we see it. Um, and today I know a lot more. I wouldn't even, I think cardiovascular training is fine, but I think exercising with m some resistance is even better. And there's l new science in, this, uh, in exercise physiology. You can see that if you train, overtrain, you actually damage the mitochondria. People who are running miles and miles are actually, and I'm one of them. I ran track and field. As a matter of fact, in 68, I went to City College for one year, two years, before I went to San Francisco State. I qualified for the 68 Olympics. I was 100, 200 meter. But I was not in a mindset. I was a very shy guy in college, so I was not in a mindset to qualify and, uh, and go into track and field. But I learned a lot in track and field that helped me work with athletes. But one thing I did, I ran miles, I ran uh, uh, cross country, I did a lot of excessive running. And it put a lot of stress when I was 50 years old and I uh, seriously injured my hip. But I learned today that really, I don't do any cardiovascular anymore. I just do movement, regular movement, every day. I move all the time, I don't sit. And I feel better. As a matter of fact, I have tremendous strength. I can do things that most people can't do you know, today, like headstand push-ups, which, you know, I do that almost every day as part of my physical workout. But I only do resistive exercise, and I do a lot of uh, posture and flexibility. And I find that flexibility is even more important as you get older. And I spend a lot more time doing flexibility than anything else. And it's really helped me recover faster. And I've started training a few more athletes recently, and we started in, uh, applying flexibility and core exercises, and they were always constantly overtrained and had shoulder injuries, et cetera. So now what I'm looking at, and I'm studying a lot, and I learned something from um, 
um, Roy Walford. He mentioned the reason he was working on cal caloric restriction diet was he was realizing life extension can be obtained by reducing the burden of mitochondrial function. And I talk to John Ferber and Steve about this all the time. And there's a guy in Denmark and Sweden, his name is Brunk, B-R-U-N-K. He's one of the leaders in this whole field of autophagy, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. And so one of the things is um, the mitochondria is really an incredible thing. It's, you know, we talk about it. It basically started the human uh, uh, life. It started the... Uh, uh, basically all living systems, right? A billion years ago, this bacteria had a DNA and encapsulated in the membrane and created life. Billions of years ago. And it was through the comets and the meteors and this, uh, the right uh, temperature, the right elements in the water and the thermodynamics and the right uh, soil and minerals, etc. And so another thing uh, recently, I've been working a lot with cancer patients with Robert Rowan, Frank Schallenberg, and Len Saputa, and I forwarded them a, an article on uh, excessive stimulation, which is um, a problem in cancer. And uh, mitochondria controls basically your P53, which controls the growth of abnormal tissue by blocking further growth. You've got five stages of growth of phases in a cell and you have these P53, P21s, and they stop these abnormal tissues from developing, they actually repair them. But if the mitochondria is not functioning right, it cannot develop these uh, tumor suppressors. And they let them go, and that's where you have abnormal cells, uh, fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, and many other forms of uh, development. And recently, several new papers came out, and I, um, looked at them and it's basically if you have excessive stimulation due to environmental factors, uh, toxins in our air and, our, and viruses and bacteria and heavy metals and chemicals and injuries and we live in a chronic state of stress, stress folks, and we don't get rid of these stressful conditions, what happens is the immune has to, you have the CD4 and CD8, CD4 recognizes a bacteria, a virus, a heavy metal, an abnormal cell, and addresses the abnormal cell by tagging the cell. The CDA comes in and recognizes that and attacks the target. The problem is when we compromise immunity due to excessive chemicals in our diet and the way we eat the, and how we eat and the stress and not sleeping well, because sleep, while you're sleeping, Steve and I would talk about all, is that you're, you're actually repairing your body, you're regenerating, you're creating a new brain, a new cell. So whatever you do during the day doesn't make a difference. It's how you sleep at night. And CD4 and CD8 is also governed by what? The mitochondria. If the mitochondria is functioning, CD4 functions and CD8. So now autoimmune disease is is a problem because we have an abnormal uh, burden on the CD4 not recognizing or over tagging a cell and over tagging it and the CDA not knowing how to stop itself it keeps fighting and keeps sending messages and keeps bombarding there we have an overwhelming cell there the mitochondria um, has that so what I found in cancer is the same thing Excessive stimulation leads to swelling of a cell. You have accumulation of water and you have calcium excitation going into the cell. Then you have an inflammatory uh, condition. You have uh, hypoxia going up. You uh, lose oxygen. Uh, you don't utilize oxygen correctly. Then the cell goes and the demand for energy is greater. The mitochondria becomes more active becomes more hungrier. It needs more energy, but it doesn't require oxygen because it's not utilizing oxygen correctly. So it goes after fatty acids, then protein. It becomes a nitrogen-bound tissue, and it grows on that. And the way 
that all the new science is looking at, and Frank and Robert and I talk about it, is how to correct the mechanism of the mitochondria to go back to CO2. It's now working on lactic acid, ammonia, and recycles that ammonia and carbon monoxide and turns it into lactic acid. We want to convert it, and that's important. And some of the things we can do that is there's a lot of good data now that they found that if you're getting cancer and you're going to get any form of chemo radiation, fast for 24 hours. There's new data showing that there's less stress, less uh, invasiveness in the body, less toxicity if you fast for 24 hours. Google it, you'll see it on, tw uh, on UCLA's um, published papers on cancer and fasting. Okay? 24 hours. Okay, one of the things that we can do to enhance our mitochondria and improve it, and I've been looking at it for quite a few years now, is aut autophagy, which is a way to recycle the damage. There's 37 genes in the mitochondria, but 13 of them get uh, highly reactive species. That means they get a lot of uh, uh, free radical damage because they're closest to where the mechanism of making uh, energy. And the best way to do that I spoke and I had a chance to spend a lot, uh, some time with Anna Marie Cuervo out of Einstein University. Her research was if you intermittently fast and you don't eat anything for at least 12, 14, 16 hours and then you can go and do a little exercise but not heavy exercise, you actually induce autophagy and that means you house clean. That means you get rid of the misfolding proteins, the damaged proteins that are in the cells and cleans it out and it's like a recycling machine. You sweep the, gar uh, the uh, dust into the garbage pan, somebody comes in and picks up the garbage, puts it outside the door, and they wait for a recycle. We have that mechanism, and that's what really keeps our cells alive. And that's why caloric restriction diet works, because it mainly increases autophagy through a system called sirtuin 6 which is a mitochondria energy producing mechanism and it keeps the uh, uh, sirtuin 1, uh, 3, and 6 active, and that's what helps with uh, house cleaning. The other thing also, here's the process of autophagy, and I don't need to go into that, but again, we talked about mental a a attitude and all that, but one of the other things that also is identical to um, what I call um, Here's the Krebs cycle, the nutrients. Niacinamide is very important. Even Frank and I had a long discussion of this, is that niacinamide is probably one of the best ways to keep the NAD up high, keep it in an oxidized state. If you maintain the mitochondria in an oxidized state, uh, you will extend lifespan. Now, if you look at Richard Miller, PhD, MD, and John Ferber and I were talking about it last night. I've introduced him to about six other people. Ray P talks about it. There's a guy named uh, Lopez. And from, if you restrict yourself from tryptophan, cysteine, methionine, iron, and polyunsaturated oils, you will extend the lifespan. Look up Richard Miller, PhD, MD. He did an extensive study. Uh, I just recently got off the phone and spoke with uh, Makhtar Shafari, and the same thing, she, uh, she made a presentation recently on tryptophan restriction, and methionine restriction diet, which actually extends the lifespan of humans. So these are key factors for energy, those uh, nutrients right there. Thank you. So now we'd like to have a discussion. So Susan, did, did you want to pass out cards thing, right? Write questions down or want to ask questions? Okay. I have a question. What happens when CoQ10 is destroyed? Yeah, that would if you have that CoQ10 in your heart. Shut down the power. Because we were always talking about CoQ10, but I'm not an understander of it. Give him the mic. You gotta get the mic. Our body actually produces vitamin K, CoQ10, and other really essential fat-soluble nutrients. 
The statins, because they block up the pathway so high up, they cut out the production of those nutrients. So your CoQ10 levels drop. The interesting thing is, I had read this, and then I actually looked it up, that I think it was Merck actually took out a patent in 1992 for a statin plus CoQ10. It never went anywhere. They never told the doctors. And they never told anybody. So in other words, they took it out knowing, I think this is a problem, but never commercial. I think they took it out just to protect themselves because they knew that, that statins will decrease your CoQ10. And again, probably vitamin K and other fat soluble nutrients. Okay, just, just looking at this from a practical viewpoint. Um, if, you, if you go ahead and block the production of um, ubiquinol or ubiquinone, which is the other name for coenzyme Q10, by the way, way what does that word remind you of? That word reminds, it makes you think of ubiquitous. It's ubiquitous because it's in all the cells of the body. All the cells of the body need to make coenzyme Q10. They do make CoQ10. If you take a statin where you're um, blocking a very necessary basic um, um, biochemical and physiologic process, you're going to have problems. You can um, take something to artificially lower um, your lipid levels. By the way, the lipid, um, lipid uh, theory of uh, the cholesterol theory of uh, disease um, damaging the, uh, the cholesterol theory um, for arterial uh, damage is straight out wrong, by the way. Um, the uh, cholesterol streaks and uh, fatty streaks that they uh, developed this theory on back in, what was it, 1930s with rabbits? What was that? Yeah, yeah. So it, basically what they, what they did was they um, took some rabbits and they diced, they, they gave them a high fat diet and they dissected them and they found these fatty streaks in the arteries and they said, oh okay, well that's cholesterol, well let's see, um, that must be the cause. But here's a good analogy, I like to put things in analogies because science is really, really fun and when you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense. But anyway, basically um, the fatty streaks in the arteries um, are essentially um, the uh, analogous to the skid marks in a car accident. In a car accident, um, the skid marks are the rigid, residual effect of the car accident. You've got the skid marks, you may have some broken glass around and you know a few metal parts. That's as a result of the accident. That did not cause the accident. Uh, the cause of the accident, maybe someone was texting on their cell, on their phone, or not paying attention, or whatever. But so the skid marks in the glass are the residual effects of the accident, but they did not cause the accident. That's a good analogy of the fatty streaks in the cholesterol. So I'll wrap it up real quick. But the bottom line is, when you so you can you can change the numbers by taking a statin but you are doing a lot of damage to basic cellular uh, energetic processes um, when you use a statin that is blocking the, the ubiquinol production of the cell. If uh, you have a lot of mitochondria in your heart cells, uh, so a couple of questions about mitochondrial population then. Does having more mitochondria in a given cell, uh, is that a good idea? If I exercise my muscles, do the muscles gain more mitochondria per cell? Is it a good idea or how do you induce more mitochondria per, per cell, if that's a good idea? And lastly, sorry to throw this all out, but I'll say, does caloric restriction perhaps work by maybe inducing more mitochondria per cell because then that's a way of uh, scavenging more uh, uh, energy out of scarce resources. So, what caloric restriction does is it, it helps to conserve the mitochondria from burning up so fast and producing a lot of free radical damage. 
Okay. So how do you, is having more of an idea for self, does exercising do that? Well, ex uh, as, uh, if you do the right exercise, meaning strength exercises, resistive exercise, you actually increase mitochondria production. There's a biogenesis of mitochondria. You can actually regenerate new ones. That's been uh, shown in exercise physiology recently. Um, in caloric restriction, what you're doing is the base, uh, basically you're reducing heavy metals and chemicals, inducing problems into the body. That was the main factor that they found. And now if you look at Ray, uh, Ray Miller and five, six new papers just came out on restriction of amino acids, it does the same thing as caloric restriction without doing the caloric restriction. And if you want, uh, if Steve has about two minutes, you can give him your theory on the, uh, you know, on the um, carbohydrate loading for uh, mitochondria. You know. You got two minutes, Steve? Sure. <laughs> 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 Gee whiz. Um, there's a there's a lot of focus on um, uh, through a lot of the uh, ancestral diet advocates and um, uh, uh, ketosis advocates and uh, uh, that um, selective fasting and partial fasting is a way to replicate a lot of these effects and that um, the argument goes back to you know ancestral humans walking the earth um, alternating between incidents of overeating and undereating you know when they would find food they'd overeat and then when they wouldn't find food they they'd, they'd starve and that this idea of of variable eating falls into a lot of this idea of doing protein restriction or doing carb restriction or doing fat restriction um, uh, it, it selectively as a way of minimizing the damage to the system of just basically not eating anything at all. So if you, for example, eat uh, a meal that is nothing but salad with coconut oil dressing on it, um, there's minimal protein in that, in that meal. And so that mimics um, uh, one aspect of starvation. Um, if you eat a meal that's um, high in uh, meat or possibly some kinds of grain, but mainly meat um, and fat, then you're restricting carbohydrate, which is another aspect of starvation. You know, so that you're, in a sense, um, turning on the backup power supply for the cells, which is fat burning metabolism. And so these are ways that, uh, that, that I'd say that cutting edge people looking at exercise are finding as very rich ground is this idea that you don't have to stop eating everything in order to get benefits from it. And selective fasting and partial fasting is the direction everybody's going. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You know, I have a book that's by Evolutionary Diet by this guy who was a, uh, what the hell was it? He worked at UCLA. I can't remember what he was an economist. I think he was, but he lives his life like a uh, like a lion, basically, because he believes that we're carnivores, and so he works out maybe three times in a week, and he'll work out maybe about 20 minutes or a half an hour, but he does heavy weights, does real quick, uh, uh, you know, exercise, and then he goes back and you know screws around with another two days because he says basically that's how the lions would live. They just when they get ready to eat, they get up, they get to it, they eat, they go back and sleep and whatever. It's an interesting philosophy. And the other thing he doesn't do, he has no no uh, grains in his diet, zero. No french fries, no bread, none of that kind of stuff. And all the things I've read says that grains are alien to who we are. Hi. Uh, could you comment on Dave Asprey's uh, intermittent fasting with the special coffee? Um, I have my own take on uh, caloric restriction. I've had a few patients that came to me, you know, we're now talking specifically about mitochondria, so I want to stay on topic. But with respect to caloric restriction, I am not really convinced that caloric restriction as 
measuring every grain of food because that's what people do every single grain of food I'm not convinced that leads to long lives I think it leads to very low energy because they all become hypothyroid they all have no sex drive and they end up having marital problems so the problem is in America it's not caloric restriction in America and I'm not referring to everybody in this auditorium in America stop eating like pigs because everybody you know the average diet in America is probably 2,500 to 3,000 calories so caloric restriction for the average American is probably 1,500 calories. That's caloric restriction. So it's not caloric restriction where you get down to 800 calories, 1,100 calories. I think it's just simply eating less. I do agree. I am really big on protein. I'm big on carbo restriction to the point where now I'm telling everybody who wants to lose weight, no grains. No grains. Bread, pasta, because I'm just seeing too, people, too many people who are gluten intolerant. Now, getting back to the mitochondrial thing, I think if you exercise a lot, you probably will increase your mitochondrial density, maybe the density and cells are rapidly turning over, which creates new mitochondria. I think that's the mechanism. People in America eat like every day is Thanksgiving, <laughs> which is very unique. Well, you want to talk to them? Yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like to respond to some of the points. Some of the people on caloric restriction think that maybe if you just stop eating like about five in the evening and maybe wait till a little later, not eat anything overnight, you know, like, and then not till sometime in the morning, that intermittent caloric restriction is fairly effective. Now, in response to the thing that Steve was that saying, I was looking at some material by a Dr. Schwartzbein down in Santa Barbara, an endocrinologist, right. and she was saying if you have a high protein load in a meal, especially in the morning, and I think Vern would like a high protein load in the morning, that, w that it alone will set off the compensa compensation uh, uh, hormones, like glucagon, uh, epinephrine, and cortisol, and that will end up you know, causing more long-term damage to the body through a pathway called GSK3, and that ultimately that will be a setup for problems in the brain, you know, yeah. et cetera. So uh, I think she would probably recommend putting some complex carbohydrates. I haven't gotten far enough in her material to see what she recommends, but I think that's where she's going. So just eating pro so I think that, you know, just proteins and the Atkin type diet will be good for a while and get things going and maybe get the sugars going, but she would say long term, it's a very bad thing. I'm going to see if we can get her to come up and talk. She was a doctor in, in Santa Barbara and she deals with uh, diabetics. And she started her practice and she was doing the typical diet and she had them eating tons of carbohydrates and they were getting sicker and sicker and dying. And so she had an epiphany one day and she said, huh let's reverse this. And she started having them eat eggs, bacon, and she stopped the carbohydrates and the diabetic patients, it was like magic. They got well, they got energy, and it changed her practice and she became legendary down in Santa Barbara. Piggybacking on what Susan's saying, um, one of the things that, that Bern mentioned and Susan bring this together, um, when you have protein in the morning, um, and adequate protein in the morning, women listen up because I always see this. Um, when you have adequate protein in the morning, um, you are uh, decreasing your cortisol. Cortisol is elevated at night due to your, your again, this is one of these fun little scientific biochemical things that happen in your body. What happens at night, your body um, you, you raise melatonin as long as you're not on your iPhone or iPad or I anything, um, suppressing the melatonin uh, with the light coming into your, even TV. During, so t if you got TV in your bedroom, take it out. Um, or in your iPhone, iPad and everything. Don't have that on within um, 30, uh, what the research, the 367 research studies uh, recently um, say um, not within an hour. I give people leeway. Okay, 30 minutes, but also you can get these um, glasses. Dr. Um, Oz uh, mentioned this on his TV show a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can get these uh, orange, yellow 
um, glasses because the reality is a lot of people do like to you know do fool, do this and fool around right before they go to bed. But that's one way you can um, help with melatonin um, not being suppressed so much. Also, your growth hormone goes up primarily at night. So, bottom line is in the, that that results in when you're not eating during the the seven eight hours of sleep at night, um, then your cortisol naturally goes up because it has to pull sugar from uh, lean body stores to keep the brain functioning because your body's going to do everything that it can to keep your brain functioning. So it, it makes sugar, it raises your blood sugar through a process called gluconeogenesis and then you get the it increased cortisol. So your cortisol is higher in the morning. So the bottom line is if and cortisol, if it's secreted too high, too long throughout the day, then basically you're stressing yourself out. So when you have the starchy carbohydrates and don't have enough protein in the morning, you're stressing your body out. So you gotta have adequate protein in the morning. Adequate protein in the morning, you gotta have about 30 grams protein in the morning with other nutrients, but about 30 grams protein in the morning. Next question. Yeah, um, Dave is, favors a, um, a no protein uh, start to the day. Um, so he his breakfast is a cup of coffee and uh, butter, uh, or half a stick of butter. Yeah, yeah. But he blends it into his coffee, and it's like cream, only it's very very high in fat and and low in protein. And he deliberately does that, um, I think, for a variety of reasons that that. Some have to do with uh, autophagy mechanisms, um, but others have to do with the fact that he doesn't want to turn off his fat burning metabolism. So if he, if he eats a big dinner in the evening um, and then goes to sleep and then enters ketosis and stays in ketosis and wakes up in the morning and by taking a, um, a, a coffee butter breakfast, he doesn't turn off his fat burning metabolism. So he keeps it active all the way into the um, late, or actually mid, mid afternoon. So he eats something for lunch at about like two o'clock or something like that in the afternoon. That's when he eats lunch and he eats dinner at a regular time. And, um, but I think part of what he's also doing is that by choosing coffee, um, he's adding a thermogenic agent to his morning routine. So he's, in a sense, uncoupling his mitochondria so that they generate more energy and that is part of this, the, the morning energizing process that takes place in humans. Mm -hmm. So at nighttime, when we're sleeping, we're hibernating, our metabolic rate is lower, and then during the day, our metabolic rate comes up, and taking a shot of something like um, caffeine in the morning uh, facilitates that process. Um, Steve Richfield would say, well, you shouldn't do that because it's going to sabotage your sleep, but you should use, let's say, Cytomel, um, T, uh, yeah, you know, T3. T3. Just get three hours of thyroid effect first thing in the morning to rev yourself up. Um, you can do the same thing with MCT oil or with coconut oil um, as a breakfast. Um, just you know, give yourself a shot of energy to stimulate that warming up process. So. You know, I think that really answers the question of the strategy behind what Dave is doing. Um, I don't like it for several reasons, one having to do with the fact that butter, a lot of people don't tolerate butter very well, and another one about caffeine and the downside of, of caffeine on sleep quality the following night and this kind of thing. But um, there are a lot of, kinds of ways of, of doing it without those kinds of things, and so there's a migration path. Instead of using butter, you can use, um, uh, you can use coconut oil. Um, even though you can't blend it into your coffee because it just floats right on top of your coffee when you're done in, in three seconds. But um, you, can, you can use tea as a delivery vehicle to, to have some warm fat in your diet in the morning. Um, the other process that I think should be discussed having to do with um, uh, Douglas and his comment about uh, stress is that Darkness is fundamentally stressful to humans. Yeah. And that is because um, the, 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 the enzymes in that electron transport chain that are making all of our ATP, 
they absorb light. And during darkness, they don't absorb light. And it turns out that the tiny little bit of energy that they get from absorbing light um, adds to the efficiency of the, of the electron transport in the system and helps you make more ATP. And it turns out that these compounds very efficiently absorb red light. And it's, it strikes me as more than a coincidence that that's a time of the day, you know, at dawn, when red light is, when light from the sun is richest in red, is when the sun is first rising up. Uh, and we no longer go out to cultivate that kind of light. Um, so my suggestion is you do it artificially. You set up lights in your bathroom, uh, red flood lamps, um, just ordinary incandescent bulbs, because you don't have to worry about the blue light in the morning. Um, blue light will sabotage your melatonin cycle if you do it in the, in the evening. So you really need, if you want to do red light at that time, you need to have the red coating on the bulb. But in the morning, you don't. So just getting light exposure first thing in the day revs up your mitochondria in a way similar to what Dave is doing, but it's doing it with photons instead of with fat, and that that in and of itself will help turn off the, um, the cortisol and the stress reaction that is accumulated dark exposure over the nighttime. Question for Dr. Miller. On the, I think it's the Krebs cycle, um, the Oxa, oxaloacetate benagene and um, NADH. I don't understand the relationship between the two or how the two inter, intermix, interrelate. The um, you know, I've had this ongoing discussion with John Ferber about oxaloacetate, and I know the fellow who is um, the CEO of this company, Banaging, who keeps coming by and talking to me. And it seems deceptively simple. Um, it's either the last part or the first part of the Krebs cycle. And I think by looking at it, that it primes the pump. That's just sort of my intuition that they, I'll get to it, hold on a second. So I think that oxaloacetate, which is the benagene, I think that somehow does something, it's a signaling process to keep that Krebs cycle really moving around. Now, what's happening with the Krebs cycle is as it's moving around, it's spinning off all the NADs. The NADs are then getting fed to the electron transport system. So you see they're all kind of interrelated. You go around the circle, the Krebs cycle is spinning off all these NADs, the NADs get fed into the electron transport system. They go from the reduced state to the oxidase state, and they go down that system, and it really multiplies like a, a, a photovoltaic cell. It multiplies the energy and out spits 34 ATP. So it's the oxaloacetate, I think, is a signaling. That's my theory about this right now, and it's spinning off all these NADs. discussed to tonight, kind of a curiosity to me, is how your mind plays into all of this. Because, because your mind is a driver of your body. Well, positive attitude. First of all, when patients come to me, I, I kind of look at them and I, and I actually challenge them, do you really want to get better? And I can tell the people who really want to get better and the ones who say, but, you know, I got this problem, I've always had a problem with this, and I really don't tolerate this, and I've had, I'm sensitive to this. And I say, that's fine, you're throwing up all these barriers. Do you want to get better? Let's look at goals. Let's not look at the barriers. So the mindset is important there. And then I heard recently, um, it was some sports psychologist, and Bert would know about this stuff. There was a sports psychologist that works with Australian athletes on a winning attitude. Because the best, you know, the best of the best, whether it's in golf or tennis, and tennis is the best that you can see, you get to a point where it's all mental. I mean, you're four, you know, you're going back and forth, back and forth, it's mental. So whether you're trying to get healthy or whether you're trying to perform in sports, mental state is, is everything. When we were working with athletes, one of the things I learned was from uh, Tony Robbins, 
His, um, the fellow that taught him was a patient of mine, and I never knew that he was the one that taught Tony Robbins uh, virtually how to use the mind. And he gave me a lot of uh, examples to use on athletes, and one we did was we visualized um, an athlete like Bob Hayes, who is a phenomenal athlete, one of the fastest in the world, and we actually had the individual visualize himself becoming Bob Hayes and watching himself win. Visualizing winning, the goal of winning, and always winning. Um, I had a patient that was interesting, and I mentioned this at the MS conference that I just recently did in one of the fellows here. I had a, a woman with MS out of New York, never met her. I did a consultation with her. She was bedridden. And I knew there's nothing I can do other than change her diet into a low carbohydrate, high protein fat, coconut, palm oil, MCT, and virtually just had to do one thing. Look in the mirror every day and visualize yourself getting better. And say the words, I love myself, I resonate with happiness, and I'm perfect. You know, I, uh, I feel great, I am getting better, and I want her to take that state of mind into where she is actually getting better and visualize the state of herself when she was the happiest in her life, when she was perfectly physically fit and happy and put herself in that position. About two and a half, three years later, I get a call from another patient and I ask the patient, how did you get my name? I said, this woman had MS and I don't remember her anymore. And I said, well, and then she brought back the memory that she was the one I was working with who was bedridden. I said, well, what happened to her? She was in a wheelchair. She said, oh, whatever you did with her, she actually is walking again. And it's the only thing I can remember was I gave her the diet and visual imagery. That's it. And I had to do some, you know, electrical stimulation, which we uh, forward her a magnetic infrared device at that period of time that was totally different. So the mind is very powerful. One of, my, one of my beliefs is that there's an answer for everything. And that's kind of how I live my life, looking for answers. And things like there's a golfer by the name of Maria Alothabal. He's a Spaniard. And he had a back so bad that he had to crawl to the bathroom. And he was trying to figure out a way to solve his back problems. And somebody told him about a doctor in Germany. And so they wheeled him on the on the plane, haul him over to Germany, and the doctor did whatever the magic he did was, and nine months later, he was a guy who couldn't walk, had to crawl to the bathroom, and nine months later, he won the Masters Golf Tournament. And so there are answers for whatever ails you, whatever my problems you're having in life, and that's one of the theories and the beliefs that I carry with me all the time, that there are answers when I come here, I know that there are people that have answers, and my wife and I, we have a mattress, and we have the magnetic, and she swears when she gets up in the morning that she doesn't have any aches or pains because of that magnet that we sleep on. Mm -hmm. And so that's just we belong to this group. And so I'm, I think we're privileged to have all these people come by our, our path, to be honest with you. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Let's get the mic. <laughs> yeah, the mitochondria and, and the um, calorie restriction um, <coughs> and, and the panels referring to the mitochondria and the calorie restriction as a, as a cure, but the calorie restriction is the only thing that extends lives. And I'm just wondering, is it mitochondria or just the organs don't work as hard? And, and also the mitochondria, I hear the problem is sometimes it doesn't let the food in there to the cells. You know, how did the mitochondria restricts the input into the cells of the food? And that could be a problem. That's what I heard many times too. <laughs> I'm not sure if I uh, understand exactly. You understand my question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You understand the question for your Yes. I'm a caloric restriction. What Roy Walford taught me and uh, Ray Miller and them. Basically, what you're just doing is the, if you're not eating as much, you're not exposing your mitochondria to heavy metals, chemicals polyunsaturated oils. Those are the things that are really are causing problems. If we restrict just, you know, the abusiveness of the environment from uh, putting less in our body, we have a gene called a FOXO gene, F-O-X-O, look it up, 
And it's genetically there that helps us to protect against genetic damage such as mitochondria. Some people have this in their, they have the right um, lettering of the genetics, the C, G, or whatever, right next to them. You can get it measured. Those are the people that are going to live 100 years old or longer. They have that ability to handle damage more efficiently and detoxify themselves. I talked to uh, Claire, uh, what is it, Blackburn, um, Elizabeth, uh, regarding the telomeres, which she doesn't really believe is the key factor aging. She thinks there are other factors. But she does believe that the FOXO gene, which she did a study on, is a big determining factor. And what she's done in order to raise that, she's done meditation, exercise, and reducing uh, and restricting herself from the foods that are causing us harm. You know, by eating more fruits and vegetables, the right protein, grass-fed, the right fish, that's wild, you know, those are the things you do. That's all you can do. And positive attitude. Get up every morning, say I love myself, and I vibrate with happiness, and give a hug to somebody. That would probably do more for any, than anything else out there. <clears throat> Let me give you sort of an analogy that I think about, sort of a silly analogy. There's two of them actually with the mitochondria. What I tried to show you is the mitochondria is so dense in electron transport and free radicals that the increased activity is what's junking it up. You have to, you've got all this oxidative products and these free radicals that are being spun off. They need to be neutralized by alpha lipoic acid and glutathione and other high dose antioxidants. So it's sort of like the analogy that I think of is, you know, you notice how when you drive through one of these uh, self-clean um, car washes, <laughs> and you look at the walls, and the walls look filthy, and your car's getting really clean. So it's all that excess stuff, your car's getting clean, but all the spin-off there is on the walls. Or it's sort of like in your, in your shower. You're getting all clean, but you look at the walls, and the walls look all kind of scummy. And so here you are, getting clean, is really doing the process, but it's like all the excess stuff is on the walls there. And that's kind of the analogy, I think, is what's going on with your mitochondria. It's oxidizing, it's producing all this energy, but it's throwing all these byproducts because of this high oxidative potential. So in high, so athletes who over-exercise, like Bernd talked about, I've seen these people, I've seen these 30-year-old triathletes who have what I call circuit breaker problems. They just burn themselves out. They just burn out those mitochondria. So it's the rate of process. If you overuse a mitochondria, it just, just gets junked up. And then I think it gets back to the things that I was talking to um, John Ferber about, is can the lysosomes keep up with that debris, circulate, and get rid of that debris? So it's a combination of what's being generated and what can be cleaned up. That's why I sort of like the car wash example. Hi. Um, in the newsletter, it recommended minimizing methionine consumption and I was wondering if you could explain um, what is the optimal level, given that um, I think it's an essential amino acid, uh, it's uh, lipotropic, and it boosts the level of glutathione, which is recommended. So I'm confused. People like, and, and, and most everyone will tell you, even Steve, that we don't have the ability to properly break down methionine, especially because we have a B6 deficiency in our body today, even B12 and folate. And if you look at the, um, I'll give you the names of the six individuals who did their, their research on this. And uh, Richard and I talked about it, and, uh, and even, what's his name now, Robert Rowan, is now putting all of his cancer patients on a low methionine diet. If you talk to Robert Rowan, ask him why, and he's really researched that uh, by decreasing methionine in the diet, it actually, one, methionine is also known for its inflammatory mechanism, increasing uh, 
you know, cortisol levels and suppressing thyroid and also mitochondria function. That's what. Well, huh? Where's it, from? it comes from our food, uh, proteins. We talked about it the other day. By even we have to restrict certain proteins that are high in this area, you know, and methionine is one of them, and that's why homocysteine is a problem. And uh, Richard, who's been really real, uh, you know, Kenyan, he's going to be on the panel with us in April. He'll talk more about it. And and Robert uh, may even try to get him because he's now looked at methionine restriction as part of his cancer program, and he's seen the results with it. Okay, so let me give you the alternative. Uh, I think methionine is a methyl donor, and it's really important for DNA synthesis. The problem is when homocysteine does not convert to, hom to methionine, and that's when you have the MTFHR genes, and there's two varieties of those. So when you have a buildup of homocysteine, that's the problem. When it doesn't convert to methionine, when it does convert to methionine, which it's supposed to, that's a methyl donor. So I'm going to take the opposing opinion here. I think methionine is healthy for us. I'm also going to take uh, the opposing view because, the, because there's, there's more to the story than it just being that simple. Um, many people are deficient in B6, B12, and folate, not folic acid, folate uh, that you get in foods. Um, according to um, Dr. Kilmer McCulley, the um, renowned researcher on homocysteine uh, metabolism um, throughout the 60s and uh, uh, 70s um, because if you, if you have um, uh, elevated homocysteine uh, due to the enzymatic conversions due to the nutrient deficiencies then that can be a problem but the, that is again that's the skid mark that's looking at the skid marks not at the cause um, the cause of the problem is not getting sufficient um, B vitamins from the foods and uh, appropriate nutrients. More to the story, about 30% of people do not convert um, fo folate into the, or folic acid into the active form folate, I, otherwise known as 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. That's because of the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase insufficiency enzyme that's also uh, as a result of the uh, 5 MTHFR uh, genomic um, uh, association with the conversion so you have a problem there so it is not again the methionine is the skid marks that's not the cause of the accident That was partly my question, um, and I also, I missed, um, you said that a low, a low tryptophan diet and a diet low in methionine and some other things extends longevity. What were the other things? And also, if we need to sleep well in order to repair ourselves, don't we need the tryptophan to get a good night's sleep? And also, the methionine detoxifies heavy metal. Um, hang on, hang on. I'll give you the data if you want to give me your email address, and I'll forward it to you. Um, if you read Ray Pete's work, and you read, um, like I said, Robert Rowan has looked at for cancer, and he has now told three or four of my cancer patients that we're working together, he wants them on a methionine restriction diet. And well, what he's, about the tryptophan? Well, the tryptophan again, uh, and Steve is a, 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 he likes to use tryptophan at night with collagen. But he uses extremely low dosage, right? Most of you use extremely high dosages. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. It is safe around 60 milligrams to 200. Above that, there is some difficulty. Tryptophan is used on, it's also released under stress. And it's a, mediate of serotonin and also if you look at leaky gut syndrome there's a fellow at uh, Lawrence Livermore who I've been talking to they're finding that tryptophan levels are higher in irritable bowel syndromes 
And we're talking about high levels. One of the things I noticed when I was in practice, and there's some patients here of mine, everyone who has difficult sleeping has taken enormous 500 milligrams of tryptophan or more, and they can't go to sleep now. They just have a hard time. And there's a lot of, if you look up Richard Miller, he's uh, an MD, and John Ferber called me one day, he said, Bern, you gotta listen to this guy. I just came back from his, this conference. This was phenomenal. He is one of the top speakers I've heard in a long time. Richard Miller has published a number of papers on, uh, on tryptophan and restriction in animals and life extension. R.A. Miller. Just look him up. You'll see all the data that he's, uh, and, I, and there's so much data on it. If you look up PubMed, look up PubMed restriction of uh, tryptophan, you'll see a lot of data. But again, Steve is more of a mindset that he uses lower levels with collagen to achieve the same thing. You want to tell him? Well, I, I tried taking collagen, and it kept me up away at night. Depends on you. Do you yeah, take what no form of collagen do you take? It? Your, your type. Which one? The plain one I, or the I, amino I acid? Know. So I had to stop taking it because No, no, the it, plain one or the yeah. amino acid? Hey. I, I don't Was know. it the green one? I can't remember. Yeah, if it's the green one, we only want you to use it in the daytime because it's got carnitine, taurine, and glycine. These are all mediators of energy. At night, we have the blue one, which is plain. As a matter of fact, we're also putting what's called eggshell membrane calcium in there. And we have done that now with five, six individuals that I've recently taken on, and you slept better, right? Absolutely. And who's the other person that, that fellow that just left, he was a former triathlon, one of the top in the tent in I the country. I the one without the amino acids. Then you, there's something you're doing wrong with it. No, it's because um, when you take amino acids that are low in tryptophan, as collagen is. No. Yes. Yes. Because it competes against the tryptophan. So also, I used to be um, a vegetarian, so I was getting very little tryptophan, and I forced myself to start eating some chicken because it had tryptophan in it, and now I sleep okay. I never take tryptophan, but One I need to have thing, some in my to, diet. You, you're identical to a trainer I'm working with at the club. <laughs> you want to you check your thyroid. If your thyroid's not functioning, you're not going to sleep well. And that's I a big sleep factor. I sleep fine as long as I'm consuming some tryptophan. Okay. He, he, let, me, let me put it in a different way. You know, the point of a panel here is to have different points of view, so. It's nice to spice it up a little bit. Um, I think the really important thing is, and I see this often, I treat a lot of insomnia. There is no one solution for insomnia. I have like five different, and I have, I have no idea whether you're gonna eat Ambien, whether you're gonna eat GHB, which you need growth hormone, you're gonna, and, uh, you're gonna be on tryptophan. Wait a minute, wait a minute. A bit of I'm just simply pointing out, we're all different. So what you need is not what he needs, it's not what she needs, and now it's what he needs. We're all different. And so there is no one solution for any of these problems. Everybody, some people, you know, people who have schizophrenia probably have high levels of serotonin. Other people who need serotonin. When people go on SSRIs, maybe they can take Paxil, but they can't take Prozac. Maybe they can take Lexapro, but they can't take Celexa. So each one of those is the same. It's the individual variability that's the important thing, and that's why you need to have someone who addresses what's your problem and what's your solution, because it's gonna be individual. And it's gonna be individual for each one, of, each one of you here. There's no one solution that's the right solution for everybody. The solution for me is not to restrict tryptophan. That's your solution. Severely, not to restrict it severely. You know, I have a grandson and he's ADD, and he takes Ritalin, and if you and I take Ritalin, it has an entirely different effect on him. It calms him down and puts him in a state where he can concentrate. Without without Ritalin, he is a space cadet. I mean, virtually, he like nonstop just can't concentrate, goes crazy. Here we go. <laughs> Wind him up. Wind him up. Um, one aspect of variability regarding tryptophan response has to do with inflammation. And um, if you're dealing with active inflammation, one of the defense mechanisms that your body have is, is to destroy your tryptophan in your bloodstream. 
And that dramatically changes what's going on in your body. And it may even change what's going on with your tryptophan. Because when tryptophan is catabolized, it produces um, byproducts that are neurotoxic and can irritate the brain. And so some people, if they take two grams of tryptophan, um, will sleep deeply and profoundly and will even take a nap in the afternoon involuntarily. In other words, it just overwhelms them. And those people don't have inflammation and the tryptophan couples into the brain very nicely and it just sedates them uh, severely. But if somebody else has, has inflammation, their body is converting that into tryptophan into quinolinic acid, for example, which is a neurotoxin and an excitotoxin. And that means that the tryptophan isn't getting into their brain to make serotonin and or melatonin. So um, if likewise, if you're taking collagen protein before you go to bed at night and collagen protein doesn't have tryptophan in it, and it doesn't have other large neutral amino acids that are competing against tryptophan, if your tryptophan level is already low, your response to that may be entirely opposite somebody else who has a higher level of resting tryptophan in their bloodstream for them taking the collagen protein before you go to bed at night. Thank you. Okay, look, complicating things now. Looking at the whole from a functional medicine viewpoint. Um, if your gut function is off, then that's going to throw a wrench in this whole discussion here. Um, if you, uh, if your microbiome, your, your um, microflora uh, is out of balance, um, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth of the upper small intestine, um, where you have too many lactobacilli species, um, or if you have um, if you have some uh, uh, too much of um, various uh, other um, bugs, then you're going to influence serotonin production because 95 percent of the serotonin is produced by the enterochromaffin cells of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, 95 percent of serotonin. So, by the way, that uh, uh, portends to if you take an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, what is it going to do to your gut function? So we've got to think of what is going on with the gut with all this too. So therefore, for you, it may be, okay, well, you get a little tryptophan, and that's, that's, all, that's all I need. For, um, for this gentleman, maybe it may be different. Again, biochemical individuality, um, Dr. Linus Pauling, who um, was a great uh, proponent of that. Um, it's not only biochemical individual individuality, but systemic um, individuality too. Um, gut function is a big problem for a lot of people as far as their, their uh, microflora, imbalanced microflora, which uh, with many people with sleep anxiety problems, um, I start looking at gut function, and they, they wait a minute, I'm talking about my head, what are we talking about in my gut? Exactly. So anyway, um, uh, suffice it to say that um, it's, uh, all, it's not as simple as looking at uh, tryptophan levels, you have to also look at gut function. Did you ever find out that uh, looking at yourself and your finances, when you have financial problems, how different your life becomes? And you don't sleep as well, and you don't eat as well. It's all magical, but when you get a big check in the mail and your bills go away, you sleep real well, and life is good. Tom will make out a check to anybody who doesn't sleep well. <laughs> okay, um, there's some names there. Please write them down and, and look them up. They're in all the research journals of these five, six members who've published. And interesting enough, I, um, there's a professor at UC Irvine that was at the Life Extension Conference that you were, you know, you presented last year, um, was a Bruce Spindler. And I, he made a presentation, and Kitty Wells also made a presentation, and then recently speaking to Mahdav Shafari, if you t look her up, you, you'll see her impressive um, 
You know, I, I forward uh, the, the information to, you know about her, she's right? She's going to be here? May. Oh, wow. Okay. She told me she was coming up, but she, I she didn't. Um, she'll, I'll have her bring a little information on that because one of her major research was in the area of tryptophan restriction diet, and she'll explain more about it if you're interested. But look up these names, you'll find some data on it, and I think that should give you enough to look at to understand. I'm not saying completely stay away from tryptophan, it's that you don't need an or enormous amount. Uh, yes, I'd like to know how can you improve and rev up the intrinsic factor in your gut and your intestine to make more vitamin B12 and does fermented foods help? about fermented soy because I'm taking that now. He kind of convinced me. Who did? Oh, uh, Walter? Walter. He's got good studies. <coughs> now. I, I, there was one person I just recently talked with MIT. He's a Boston professor. This is for heart cancer. And I asked him the same question. She was on the Halen. Uh, you know anything about that? We talked about the Halen, right? And that soy fermented. Well, her sister went on it for one or two years and she still died of cancer. So, um, it, you know, there's a lot of research on genistine and inhibitory factor. The guy who is really getting, um, who really is a good proponent of uh, Halen is Brad Wicks. You know him? He's up in, uh, in Washington, Vancouver. He's an MD and he lectures a lot at uh, Richard Cunyon's seminar and he was at the, he's a big proponent of uh, Halen. And, on the gut issue, absolutely, fermented food, ultra, uh, any form of probiotics uh, helps with uptake of B12 and also producing and helping with vitamin K. And we didn't talk about enough vitamin K. I think, you know, uh, Phil and I are very strong believers of vitamin K today. I think it's going to be the next, like the CoQ10 of our time. It's going to be that big. And there's something also that you want to look at and just uh, research it yourself. Look at uh, a gene called Glotho, K-L-O-T-H-O. I forwarded to three of my cardiologist friends and they were so impressed. I forwarded to you, didn't I? The, uh, the gene, Glotho. It is one of the anti-aging genes that is now being looked and it's part of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. It's part of the epithelial endothelial lining and it could be a big factor in now heart disease. And look it up, it's K-L-O-T-H-O. There's a gene, and what it does, it monitors calcium and phosphorus. It balances calcium and phosphorus because too much phosphorus causes calcium to be uh, thrown out of the bone and into the intracellular tissue, which causes inflammation. And now this is becoming the anti-aging gene, and it's right there. PubMed has uh, published new papers on uh, glothogene, and I forwarded to Richard Cunyon and and, um, and Robert and, and Len, and they all came back and says this is very, very important now that we need to look at this. And it's controlled by vitamin D and vitamin K and calcium. We need them all. So where does K come from? From vegetables, green vegetables, cheese, right? Um, Gra yeah, grass-fed, uh, uh, even CLA, uh, comes from grass-fed butter. It's high in butter if it's grass-fed. And you get it from, uh, Italian parsley has a tremendous amount of it. I was looking at research in K, and you get it from also from bacteria. It's in a bacteria of K1 and converts. Um, Richard Cunningham and I talk a lot about it. He's really a big proponent. I remember when he came to my office, he loves K. K1 and K2 is his big thing right now. You need the right K though. The K1 is not good for you. Like the K2, the K7. No, K1 in high you? amounts converts to K2. Yeah. We're, we're, let, me, let me get back to what you had asked. You asked about intrinsic factor. That was really an interesting question because I don't have the exact answer. I can tell you what makes it worse are acid blockers. That'll destroy, because it destroys the acid in your stomach, acid in the stomach. Now you don't, develop, you don't absorb your calcium. You don't absorb your vitamin B12. You don't hydrolyze your protein. And you're probably going to develop osteoporosis. So the specific 
question about intrinsic factor, that's a really good question. I don't have the answer. But the absorption of vitamin B12, which actually is a very complex process, um, I can tell you the one thing you don't want to be taking is stomach acid blockers. I had doctors had me on for 15 years. I took Zantac and Prilosec for 15 years. And I had a friend of mine as a doctor, and I told him I had a hiatal hernia. And he said, what are you doing for it? And I said, I'm taking Prilosec. And he goes, you better get off that crap. And I'm like, really? And so I stopped it, kind of changed my diet, then I did research about it, and I, what I learned about Prilosec and Zantac and this stuff, and I had a heart attack in 2002, and I began to think about it, because when you take an anti-acid, it inhibits the breakdown of your proteins. And remember, your bloodstream is a river, and all the crap that you eat and put in your body is in that bloodstream. And I began to think about that because what was going on in my bloodstream was certainly not healthy. But I never had a doctor, I used to tell my doctor, I used to say to her, I said, well, I'm having problems with, with acid reflux. And she'd tell me the magic. She said, well, take a couple of them. <laughs> well, one, you, one thing you learn about sports medicine, and Bern will tell you this, is that these guys, when they played football, and they got these injections so they could play another game. What you never get to see is when they're 50 years old and when they're trying to get out of bed in the morning and when they're trying to go to the bathroom, you never see the, or the agony that they're in. All these guys that take football hits, these, these, uh, these halfbacks, these, these, these uh, ends, they go up and catch a football and they take a shot. Well, I want to tell you, when they hit 50, 60, they're lucky if they can walk because they're beat to death. Uh, Joe Namath has two artificial knees, and it goes on and on. So all these things, these drugs that people give you, and you get into all these, these, these pain inhibitors, there's a price to pay. There are no free lunches. Get it? <laughs> Get, getting back to that uh, question, um, and also related to the uh, acid blockers. Um, the acid blockers are doing, first of all, if you look on the label, they're not to be taken uh, except for short term, uh, four, six weeks. Uh, they never said that to me. It's, it's, <laughs> on, it's on the, the insert, it's right there. Directions are amazing. Yeah, amazing, yeah. So anyway, when you, when you do that, um, also, what are you doing? You're suppressing a basic function of the body. To di Digestion starts in the mouth, but it also, a lot of digestion also occurs um, in the stomach. What have you got going on in the stomach? You've got a high, you should have a high acidic content. What does that do? That um, influences the opening and closing of the sphincters, both above the stomach and below the stomach. If you suppress stomach acid, what are you doing? You're, you're affecting that opening and closing of those sphincters. Um, Dr. Jonathan Wright, up in, um, uh, Tahom at the Tahoma Clinic in Washington, he's been saying for 40, 45 years, the biggest problem with GERD or stomach acid symptoms is actually too low stomach acid. Because what happens is, as we get older, in general, our stomach acid production decreases. So what I, what I do, have done repeatedly with my patients, and they at first are scared, but I tell them, okay, we, I want you to stop the acid block. But doc, I've been, you know, doing this for years, and I, you know, I still can't digest dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, and everything. It gives me all kinds of gas and everything. Yeah, because B, there, what happens in the stomach? B vitamin uh, breakdown and um, a, a absorption starts, and protein also. 
So when you start fooling around with your stomach acid, with these acid blockers, you're blocking B vitamin absorption and protein absorption. What are you going to do to your immune system with protein absorption? Immunoglobulins aren't going to be made as well. Your immune system's going to be functioning. What, are you, what about B vitamins? You're going to have methylation reaction problems, homocysteine elevation, et cetera. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can stop the stomach acid and you can, uh, you, uh, if you actually have GERD, you can actually stop the stomach acid. You can use a little bit of a acidic apple cider vi vinegar um, to help uh, acid production. You can temporarily, even in older people, well, I say older, now that I'm 55, I don't consider myself older. So in young, uh, vibrant people of uh, my age, uh, in their 50s, that uh, do a lot of these things that, that I'm telling you, uh, that they do work. Um, anyway, you can temporarily ramp up their uh, hydrochloric acid by temp oftentimes only temporarily you need to take uh, some extra hydrochloric acid capsules as long as you don't have an active ulcer. Um, and, um, and so you can improve the stomach acid production and improve all those mechanisms so that you can absorb your foods. If you have acid reflux, one of the things I've come across is if you have, I, I use mango, mango juice, aloe, and seltzer water, and it does magic. I mean, it, aloe is magic. I mean, it's unbelievable. But I take that, and the acid reflux will go away. You can use apple cider vinegar, apple cider vinegar, and it will also do magic. Also with your blood pressure, by the way. Uh, no. <clears throat> Baking soda is exactly the wrong thing to do. Or take, you know, buffered uh, vitamin C tablets, which I mentioned way, way back in the beginning for the whole thing. Uh, you know, hydrochloric acid production in the stomach is a dynamic process. In other words, your stomach doesn't store acid, it generates it on demand. The food comes in, your stomach has to produce the acid. You need your mitochondrial metabolism to produce that acid. That's the theme that we're getting to here. It's all about energy production. You need your cellular energy production to make digestive enzymes. You need your cellular energy production to heal. You need it to move the, the food through your digestive system. You need it to synthesize neurotransmitters for sleep. Um, you know, energy affects all the systems of the body. So if you have a symptom like digestive issues or um, acid reflux disease, look to the mitochondria. There's something wrong at that level. Energy production. I have a question. What happens when you have your gallbladder out? Again, everybody's going to have a different opinion. I'm always quite amazed at the number of patients that come to see me with gallbladder, they've had them removed, and half of them, they don't have problems. They don't have problems because somehow their liver just takes over the bile production, okay? But it's also possible some of them have learned how to modify their diet. They're not eating a high-fat diet. They've sort of learned how to modify around. They've learned how to maybe take enzymes. But I, I gotta be honest with you, I, I'm surprised the number of people who don't have problems after they've had their gallbladder taken out. Is that woman still here with the uh, tryptophan? Uh, also, try one thing really works, and I do it with my um, with my daughters. Uh, glycine. Take about 500 milligrams to a thousand of uh, glycine at night. There is a patent, a clinical study out of Japan, and they have a patent on glycine and insomnia. And also, just to give somebody, uh, I I Google something very important. Um, the National Cancer um, group NIH and NCBI has a whole thing on restriction of tryptophan and methionine and you can look it up in Oxford journals it's the uh, gerontology biology science and medical science published in 2009 please look at that one it tells you good references all I'm trying to say is that I had a diet that was very very low in tryptophan and very very low in methionine and I ended up with heavy metal poisoning and insomnia so I just went back to a normal diet, and those things went away. So I had to add some fish and some chicken, a little bit of turkey into my diet, 
So I don't need to take glycine or tryptophan or anything else. I just need to eat. You know, but you're also food. supporting the thyroid. When you eat protein, yes. you're supporting the thyroid. Exactly. He needed more protein. I needed yeah. more. I needed yeah. more. Vegan diets are not I needed more tryptophan yeah. and more vitamins. One of the vegan diets are not healthy. One of the I was athletes never I'm vegan. working right now, she is a 27-year-old athlete <laughs> who has the same issue. Burn. 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 Her diet was vegetarian, and once she got on, on a protein no, diet, it was, it, was veg it was vegetarian plus fish. Yeah. But there, I seem to need a little bit of chicken and a little bit of Yeah, you need, you need some protein, some yeah. real protein. Yeah. No, well, let's, coming back to intrinsic factor, if I'm not mistaken, when you take B12 as a supplement, you don't need intrinsic factor because the function of intrinsic factor is to participate when the protein is digested and the, and the, uh, uh, the B12 is released from the meat, then you can absorb it and so forth, and you, have, you don't have a B12 deficiency. But if you take it supplementally, you, intrinsic factor and even some of these digestive problems may be bypassed. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that there's an excellent book on, uh, on stomach acid problem, and by the way, this discussion has been wonderful, by uh, Jonathan Wright. It's one, of, it's one of his books, and it, it's got all the references in there. And now, when you see the list of things that go wrong, when you, when you block stomach acid production, it's one of these great scandals. I mean, it's right up there with the statin scandal. And, and, and you know, we've all, I, I don't know if people have been paying attention, but there have been so many drugs like the ones you were taking that just are, the, the, the price is, is just way beyond the benefit. Um, this is, suppose there was someone, this isn't for me, but say someone like me that's a little bit overweight. Someone like me that's a little bit overweight, say. Would, would, I, uh, would this person uh, live longer and be healthier if they lost weight down to some thin level and they lost it carefully? How, how much longer would this person live and be healthy? An unknown. I, I'm going to pass that on. I, I can't tell you how long. I, I don't know. Depend, it depends on the individual. Hour and a half. <laughs> I think if you lose weight, you'll always be healthier. You're going to have a lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of heart disease. Do you see lots of people who are way overweight when they're 85 and 90? Not very many. Not too many, okay? There was a study, I think, that came out that said, oh, incidentally, people who are overweight actually live healthier lives. I'm not buying it. I just don't see that. It's not what I see. So there is an ideal weight for everybody. Everybody has a different ideal weight. But most of what I see, if you're overweight, you're going to have high blood pressure. You're going to be at risk for diabetes. You're at risk for cardiovascular disease. And you just feel better when you're young, lighter. I mean, I've, I've finally, it's taken me 10 years to get down to the exact weight I wanted to get down to. And I just feel better. I just feel better. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an appearance thing. We all feel better. All women want to look thinner. Most women want to look thinner. Most guys want to look thinner. But it's a matter of can you or do you want to? I mean, I have women come to me and say, what dress size do you wear? I'd wear a size six. Well, but I really wanted a two. The ones that are 14, I really want to get into an eight. Reduce stress, meditation, and movement, and that's the key. Did you ever notice when you get, did you ever notice when you get older that the, no, that the chairs older. and the floor gets farther away? <laughs> I, I would say that when you're looking at obesity, to keep in mind that there's a huge prejudice within the governmental system and the, the public health authorities regarding obesity and that if you look at the relative risk of obesity compared to insulin resistance, you probably find that, that obesity is 25% of the problem and, and insulin resistance is 75% yeah. of the problem. So if you have obesity without insulin resistance, you're probably pretty good, well off. But if you aren't obese and you have insulin resistance, you're, you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> that technical term. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure obesity. 
<laughs> I'm not sure that obesity is the same for everybody. Yeah, because there, there, there are different bills. Where is the positive? They're right. They're, they're, they're just, they're just uh, stop that. Stop that. <laughs> Behave. I'm all the time. All right. Any other questions? Where got it? Oh, tryptophan. <laughs> Holy moly. I'm starting to fall asleep here on this one. <laughs> Does that? This has to do with insulin resistance, and I've been reading that um, when you eat meat, that raises um, your insulin levels even faster than, or even more than when you eat sugar. And so it's really confusing for me to know what to eat at this point, if you want to avoid becoming insulin resistant. We're saying the problem, we shouldn't be looking at insulin resistance, we should be looking at insulin signaling, because there could be people with very low insulin that are ha going to have just as many problems for the, because of the same <coughs> pathway. So uh, we need more answers. All right, let's give the panel a hand. Thank you. Announcement. Next speaker will be James Lavelle, who lectures a lot at the Institute for Functional Medicine and Anti-Aging. He's brilliant. He's got lots of books. Also, the night before, if you can't make it here, he'll be speaking at the Commonwealth Club. The month after that will be the person that Byrne referred to before. Oh, and a short talk next time will be on EMF by uh, Elise St. Charles, with our moderator here. It's in the newsletter.